Good morning, afternoon or evening, depending on where you join us from. I acknowledge the traditional custodians on the lands of, on which we meet all around Australia and also um, around the world. I will pay respects to these elders past and present. I've been reading a bit about our guest presenter ever since the Deafblind Information Project Manager, Meredith Prane, got up at 4 a.m. to watch one of his presentations. When her alarm went off that morning, she thought this better be worth it. And <laughs> indeed it was. <laughs> it was that experience that led her to track him down and ask him to share it again with you now. Our guest's involvement in deaf blindness spans his career of over 40 years. He has dedicated his working life to the challenge of educating, advocating, keeping people himself informed, and is perhaps, like so many others in the field, continually drawn in by the spellbinding nature of each individual's deafblind experience and perspective forever propelled forward by an aspiration that for their whole lives, people with deaf blindness have access and opportunity. He retired last year as project coordinator of California Deaf Blind Services, a position he held for nearly 30 years. He has, has and continues to lecture at several universities and serves as co-chair of the National Coalition on Deaf Blindness which advocates for federal legislation and policies that promote equitable access for children and youth who are deafblind in the United States. All the way from San Francisco, California, I welcome Maurice Belot to share his presentation, The Basic Human Need for Less Ambiguity and More Opportunities for Closure towards a better understanding of your blindness. Welcome, Maurice. Thank you. Melanie, am I good to go? You are, yep. Okay, I am going to share my screen and there should be a PowerPoint there. There it is. Um, so I wanna welcome everybody. Uh, I am looking at the time, it's four minutes after the hour. Uh, I was telling Meredith and Melanie that here in the Western United States, we are having quite a terrible heat wave. And our the governor of California, our state, uh, just announced rolling brownouts and blackouts beginning four minutes ago throughout the state. So I, my stomach is in knots, but we're five minutes into this and still I have power. So I'm going to hope for the best uh, and hope that San Francisco is spared at least for, for the next hour and a half. Uh, so I, I, want, I really wanna thank you all for um, inviting me to um, give this talk. It's something that I've become very interested in over the years, uh, well, over the past maybe three years um, that I started looking into this. Um, it, 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 has this it has a lot of different components and in my mind, it all kind of comes together at some point. I'm hoping that that is true for you as well. So, so bear with me. We're going to talk about various things. Uh, I will. I actually have a slide here. Um, we're going to talk about ambiguity, closure, or need for closure. We're going to talk about anxiety and stress. We're going to talk about uh microaggressions and 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 macro issues we're going to talk about all sorts of things and then um, at the end i'm hoping it all comes together for you but we do have a half an hour uh of question and answer in case it doesn't in case it doesn't come together um, i'm here to uh to answer your questions and and help help you uh make sense of it so um i do want to say right at the beginning that I am not deafblind myself. I am sighted and hearing. Um, as Melanie said, I've I've been a teacher of the deafblind uh, for a little over forty years now. I've I've had the opportunity, as part of a statewide technical assistance and training project, to interact with probably thousands of 
of deafblind children and young adults over the years. So and 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 some of and some of those former students um, and clients have become friends. I've I have the opportunity to interact with a lot of people who are deafblind. So while I'm not deafblind myself, the the information that I'm sharing this morning for you is I'm is drawn from my experience and feedback that I've received from people who are deafblind, and I hope that I can do it justice. Uh, so to get started, before we dive too far in, let me give you three examples of, of, of lack of closure so that you have a, a little taste of sort of what we're going to be talking about. So this is an image of, uh, of, a, of a child, a fairly young child, doing a big puzzle on the floor a big rubber um, puzzle on the floor that looks like it maybe is the is the is the six dots in a braille cell, and and uh, imagine for a moment that this child has almost completed the this puzzle, and we see that one, two, three, and five and six are all in the correct place. We can't see uh, four. So imagine that four is not yet in its little place in the puzzle. So this, this student is almost finished. And a very well-intentioned, well-meaning paraeducator in his classroom looks at the clock and says, oh my gosh, it's only two minutes until recess. So, so the paraeducator goes over to this child and says, uh, the puzzle's finished. We're gonna stop doing the puzzle, puzzle because it's time to go outside and play. And, um, and this student misses out on the opportunity, one, to finish the puzzle. That's number one. Number two, I don't know if this is true in Australia, but it's definitely true of programs in California. We have a bad habit of taking away work from children and then taking it apart or putting it back to the beginning. So when the child gets it back, they, they go back to the, to the very beginning. So a very well-intentioned, no, no bad intentions here, but a, a well-intentioned paraeducator or teacher might uh, take this puzzle and while the child's at recess, put it away on the shelf, take it apart and put it away. And the next time the child gets the puzzle, they're back to the beginning. Uh, so that's the first example. Another example, this is an image of a fairly typical uh, physical motor room for, uh, for children uh, in special education programs. It's got fake, uh, grass carpeting and of uh, various colors. It has mounds. It's got a sand, look, what looks like a sandbox and various pieces of equipment. Imagine that you are a mobility instructor and you are walking with a child to get to this room. And you've given the child a little piece of the of, of green indoor outdoor carpeting like like you see here in this room and you you're using that as an object to represent this room so you've told this child we are going to the motor room and you've given them given them an, an object so that they know where they're going they say oh yeah I, I know this texture I know I know this is the motor room I love the motor room I love going there it's my favorite place in the in the school and while we're walking to the motor room the student comes across interesting things on the on the walls that that he wasn't expecting or she wasn't expecting and and so explores and tries to figure out what what they're feeling and what's happening and as a result the mobility teacher runs out of time in the lesson to get the child to the motor room so when they're almost to the motor room they say oh 
I'm, I'm sorry, there's no more time. We have to go back to the class. And so the child has had this expectation that this is where they were going to go. And all of a sudden, um, that expectation is thwarted. The third image, this actually just happened to me two nights ago. Um, this is an image of a piece of cookie left on a plate um, with some cookie crumbs around it. And this is this idea that you are savoring a very special dessert and, um, and you're taking bites of this cookie or whatever it is, and, and you have one piece left and it's delicious and you can't wait to enjoy that very last piece. And, and even though it, you, you know it's the end of dessert uh, and you go to get that last piece and somebody has taken away your plate. Um, because again, maybe it was time, maybe they thought you were finished, maybe they thought you weren't, weren't interested. This just happened to me two nights ago at a French restaurant in my neighborhood. I was eating something and I had left some on the plate and I was going to finish it and I was yakking with my friends and I turned to look and, and the waiter had, had taken it away. Uh, so these are examples of something that I am going to draw a parallel line to. And what I'm going to draw a parallel line to is the, is the concept of microaggression. And I don't know if that's a familiar term to you in Australia, but in the United States, microaggression refers to it, Inst instances, multiple instances over a period of time that individually would be perceived as fairly slight, um, uh, fairly insignificant individual instances of, of slights or insults um, based on a person's gender or or race or class or or any any group that they're a part of individually they're small and might be seen as insignificant but added up in a in a cumulative way they become much more powerful and much more insidious and that's the, this idea of microaggression and so I have three examples of microaggressions that I have actually experienced. Um, so I, I was with a colleague one time and the colleague um, uh, uh, sp spoke to the, the hotel housekeeper in, Sp in Spanish or spoke to a woman in Spanish because he assumed she was the housekeeper and she was, and because she was Latina, he, he had made that assumption, and um, and it, and and she wasn't a housekeeper. She didn't work at the hotel, and uh, she what she uh, she was, and she responded in English. Uh, uh, a, a microaggression specific to gender, and I hear this a lot, or I heard this a lot at my for former university, where male male colleagues of mine were addressed as Mr. or Dr., but women uh, with, with the same, with the same um, position at the university are addressed by their first names. Um, uh, and then finally, this last one has to do with age, and this is something that I deal with as an older person, people making the assumption that I'm not very good at things like technology, so um, so a microaggression, uh, a microaggressive action for an older person might be saying something to an older person like, send me their contact inf info. Do you want me to show you how to do that on your phone? Um, again, these are, these are small, fairly insignificant. They happen, you know, they're, they're, people say these things happen to them all the time, but, but over time, all added together, they create something much bigger than just the, the, the small instances of microaggression. Uh, so 
So I have taken this concept of microaggression and I've borrowed it to apply to the instances that I that I that I uh, that I used at the beginning. The the student finishing the puzzle, the student not making it all the way to the motor room, um, and the student not being able to enjoy the last bite of their of their dessert. And so, I have. Um, uh, come up with this idea of something that I am calling for, for, for lack of anything better currently, I'm calling it micro stops. I think it's kind of catchy because it sounds a little bit like Microsoft, but don't, I, I hope that doesn't go too far because otherwise I'll have Microsoft lawyers outside my door tomorrow morning. Um, but this idea of micro stops multiple instances where children are and, and students who are deafblind are are prevented from finishing things. And so the, the definition that I have here on this slide is multiple and often seemingly insignificant instances during which achieving closure is thwarted and that when combined can have a cum cumulative effect of increasing an individual's stress and anxiety. So that is this idea of something that I am going to call micro stops, little things that happen to children who are deafblind often all day long um, that, that when combined, have a cumulative effect that increases their stress and anxiety. And I do want to I do want to point out again that the difference between microaggression and what I'm calling micro stops is intent. So and and we I, I don't want to argue this, but but it's possible that people who engage in microaggressive actions don't have um, uh, bad intent. They mean well. Um, I'm not sure that's always true, but but it may be true. But in terms of micro stops, I think that almost always people mean well. They they they're just not thinking about what it's like to be that child or young adult experiencing this often throughout their day or week or month or, or school year or life. So if those are micro stops, let me also differentiate between um, uh, uh, opportunities to experience closure that aren't small, that are a little bit bigger. So a, a bigger opportunity or a kind of a medium-sized opportunity to experience closure might be something like turning in assignments at school. So when you are in a general education program, you turn in an assignment, the teacher grades it, they give it back to you, and then you're finished with that. There, are, there aren't very many examples in the US education system where students are asked to do the same thing over and over and over again. Uh, maybe learning their multiplication tables. There's probably a few examples where they do the same thing over and over again until they master it. Um, now we, we have a word for doing the same thing over and over and over again, but and that word is a hobby, but Hobbies, generally speaking, are something that you enjoy. So you, you, you might do a puzzle more than once, or you may play a golf course over and over and over, but, but it's a hobby and you enjoy it. Um, so you are choosing to do that. Uh, so, um, so if I were a substitute teacher in a general ed classroom, and I, and, and, and I was just kind of winging it and trying to get through the day and, and not make too many giant mistakes, if I hand out a worksheet, if the students had just done it the day before, they would say, oh, you know, they would raise their hands and say, oh, Maurice, we already did this. And, and they'd all laugh and carry on. And I'd say, oh, I'm really sorry. And they said, yeah, we just did this yesterday. And I, I would say, oh, okay, well, I don't expect you to do it again. Um, but many children in the U.S 
U.S., many children who are deafblind are, are asked to do things over and over and over again, even though they've mastered it. Um, or even worse, given work that, that they almost finished and then are giving, given it again um, uh, uh, and have to do it again from the start. Okay, other examples of, of bigger opportunities to experience closure. Stepping up ceremonies from say middle school to high school. That's a that's a big ex closure experience. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, this is an image. Let me uh, the image of the uh, of the teacher um, handing a, a student sitting in a classroom um, uh, a, a work a worksheet that the teacher has graded and is returning to the student. Um, the next picture, the middle school to high school stepping up ceremony. This is a picture, a photo of, of a large um, group of students on a stage with a sign behind them that says moving up. And, um, and the next image is a fairly typical high school graduation ceremony. So there's, there's family members sitting in the bleachers in a stadium and the students are on the field in their red gowns and their red um, graduation caps. So graduating from high school is a, is a major opportunity to experience closure or an, or an opportunity to experience major closure. But there are others that happen throughout a, a, a student's uh, school career. Being in a, in a school play, so this is an image of I don't know what play it is, but it's, it looks like it's perhaps a musical um, that takes place in New York City. There's a background of Times Square. Um, they look like they're dressed from the 1920s or 30s. And so being in a, in a school musical, it, it has a beginning, you rehearse, it has a middle, and then it, it, you perform it, and then it has an end. You go up, you go up on stage when it's over, you take your bows, the curtain comes down, and when it's the final performance, that activity is finished. It goes in the finish box. Uh, there's no more. There's no more of that musical. Um, similarly, if you play sports, and this is an image of what looks like two uh, soccer teams finishing a, a soccer or football game and um, or match and. Uh, there, there's a team in orange and a team in white, and it would appear as though the team in orange has won. So um, the, the, the team in orange, the, the players are happy, and the, the players in the team in the white jerseys are, are miserable. When you, when you play sports, games like this are, are opportun opportunities to experience closure. The game very clearly has an end. The game ends, you go off the field, there's a winner, there's a loser, but it's very clear that, um, that this activity is over and you are moving on. So I called, um, I called small instances of lack of closure microstops. Um, I haven't settled on a name for the bigger ones yet. Um, here, here are three macrostops super stops or super sized stops, although that sounds a little bit like a McDonald's menu item. Um, but anyway, uh, I'll, I'm, I'm still working on that. And I was, uh, I was when, I, when I first started thinking about this, this subject and I, and I did a presentation for uh, the, a DBI meeting a couple of years ago, I was over at my co ex-colleague and neighbor's uh, house David Brown, and some of you may know David. He does quite a bit of work in Australia, and uh, he was laughing. And he said, "You know, if you start talking about this, there are going to be people who are going to hope that there is just kind of a, a a closure kit that you can just you can just like solve this problem by going to your school administrator and saying, I need to order this closure kit, and and then everything's going to be fine." It's not that simple. This is not a closure kit. This is an image of something that I got off the off of a website. I have no idea what it is, but it looks very. It looks like little uh, electronic instruments that are inside of a 
of a case that's kind of like a suitcase. I, I have no idea what it is, but it is whatever it is, it's definitely not a closure kit. There is no such thing as a closure kit. So, um, so, so those are some examples of small instances of, of closure or lack of closure and bigger instances of closure or lack of closure. So let's talk for just a minute about deaf blindness, stress and active engagement. What we know about children who are deaf blind and young adults who are deaf blind is that, is that many people who are deaf blind operate at high levels of stress almost all the time simply as a result of being deaf blind and i'm going to i'm going to give give some examples of 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 uh, conditions that that contribute to stress and anxiety among um, among children who are deaf blind but we know that many many children operate at high levels of stress and some even operate at levels that we would call toxic stress um, the, and we also know that it is highly unlikely that children are going to be available for active engagement. It's highly unlikely that students will be actively engaged in the curriculum or the school program if they are dealing with extraordinarily high levels of stress. And, um, and so, uh, so just, I, I wanna just kind of uh, say that right here at the beginning. And what I believe, um, let me select my page here. What, th this is my hypothesis here is that lack of opportunities to experience closure lead to generalized ambiguity and ambiguity is a key contributor to stress and anxiety in all people so this is this is the this is this is what i think is happening here is that is that lack of closure and ambiguity by well-meaning, well-intentioned people who are trying to do well for children, and I and I speak from experience because I think back of my career as a teacher and as a technical assistant specialist and as a university faculty member, and I just think about all the countless times I prevented students from uh, experiencing cl satisfactory closure or creating situations that were too ambiguous and um, and as a, as a result contributed to the students' high levels of stress and anxiety. Hold on, I, I think it jumped a slide here. Let me back up just a little bit. Okay. So here, here are eight everyday ambiguities that I think a lot of children and young adults who are deafblind experience all the time. And I, I actually know they do because they tell me that they do. Who are you? And th th these are written from the perspective of the, of the person who's deafblind. Who are you? What are you doing? Where am I? Why am I here? What's happening? Where are we going? Where did you go? And finally, one of my favorites, when will this be over? I don't think we I don't think we give that that last one enough attention. Can you imagine clicking on a YouTube video and 
having no idea whether or not it's a 45 second video or a three minute video or a one hour and 20 minute video. Um, that one of the first things I do is look down in the bottom right corner to see how long is this going to be. Um, so um, all of these all of these things are going to um, create or contribute to ambiguous situations. Now here are some more everyday ambiguities that happen to focus more on communication breakdowns, which is another significant uh, experience of people who are deafblind every day. I don't understand what you're telling me. You're not understanding what I'm trying to tell you. Why don't you understand what I mean? You misunderstood me, and now I want to go back in time so I can clarify. And here's three more. I don't want either of those two choices. I want something else. Slow down. I can't understand you when you go so fast. And this last one, I, 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 uh, I offer it um, in honor of all the, all the students I've worked with with CHARGE syndrome. I can't walk and pay attention to you at the same time. Um, so uh, situations that create uh, or contribute to ambiguity. Now, why is ambiguity such a big problem? I want, I want this to be as clear as I can possibly make it. I, I found this quote from a social psychologist named Maria Konnikova who said the human mind is incredibly averse to uncertainty and ambiguity. We strive to eliminate the stress of the unknown as humans. And let's see if I can make this advance. The reason why ambiguity is such a big problem is that ambiguity makes predicting the future very difficult. And that's what we do as humans. Our brains are, are built to be to, to predict the future. That's what we do all day long. And here on the slide, I write every decision we make in life from choosing a career to choosing a restaurant, restaurant entree is based on predicting the future. Every single thing we do is based on predicting the future. If I walk down to the subway station at eight o'clock, I probably won't get a seat and I, and, and I may be late because the trains will be crowded. If I go at 8.30, this will happen. If I uh, you know, go on this vacation based on everything I know, this is what I expect to happen when I get there. You know, every single decision we make is based on our ability as much as possible to predict the future. We think, okay, if if I, if I do this, then I think these are all the things that will happen as a result. And when we have ambiguity in our lives, it's very difficult to predict the future because ambiguity makes predicting the future almost impossible. If, if, the, if, if our lives are ambiguous and unclear and don't make a lot of sense, if situations that we're in don't make a lot of sense, then it's hard to figure out what's going to happen next. And that's, the, that's why ambiguity is such a key component to what I'm talking about. Now, let's also very briefly just talk about anxiety, um, because anxiety is 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 a key component of what we're talking about. I happen to, to be a, a very anxious person, sort of naturally, and I was a, I was just a extraordinarily anxious child. Um, 
uh, I'm glad you didn't know me then, but I was I was the kid who, you know, I was always anxious about something going wrong. Uh, every time my family would walk down to the subway station, I would heard my brothers and sisters. I was always convinced that somebody would get left behind when the subway doors closed. I mean, it just was it was always something. Um, and I, I when I was an undergraduate in 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 uh, college, I studied the work of a psychiatrist and personality theorist named Harry Stack Sullivan. And this is a photograph of Harry Stack Sullivan or Dr. Harry Stack Sullivan. And um, uh, he uh, really resonated with me because Harry Stack Sullivan had a theory. Um, and here it is. Harry Stack Sullivan believed that the single most powerful human motive is the need to avoid anxiety. And when I started reading his work, it made so much sense to me, much more than the people that came before him, like Sigmund Freud, you know, who said it was all about, you know, sex and the and the id and the ego and the super ego and all these other things. Harry, Dr. Harry Stack Sullivan said the single most powerful human motive is the need to avoid anxiety. So I want you to just think about that while we're while we're talking about this this topic and um, and how important it is to avoid anxiety at all costs. Okay. So, so this is a slide that says almost everyone wants and craves closure. We want closure. We need closure. In fact, we, see, we actively seek out opportunities for a satisfying end to something just for the good feeling that it gives us. We get a very good feeling when something ends. And I'm not talking about just a happy ending. You could be watching a movie that has a happy, a very satisfying, clear end that has a happy ending and it's and 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 it and it 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 provides you with that with that experience of of closure. You can also watch a movie that has a that is has an unsatisfying ending, but that is but but that is clear. You know, maybe it maybe the the killer the killer gets get, gets shot by the police at the end, and and well, it's good for everybody, just not not for the killer. But 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 it 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 isn't necessarily a happy ending, but it but it's a clear it's a clear ending. It's it's satisfying and it's it, and there's there's very little ambiguity, um, and it, uh, this is a uh, this is a slide that says in a work of literature. This is a quote from a writer named Mark Flanagan. In a work of literature, he writes, "The resolution is the part of the story's plot where the main problem is resolved or worked out." And I have an image here of *The Handmaid's Tale*, which is a famously ambiguous or a, a story that has a. a sorry if I'm a, if this is a spoiler for you, so spoiler alert. Um, but uh, *The Handmaid's Tale* is an example of a of a of a story of a novel that doesn't end in a in a very clear way it has a it has an ambiguous ending that leaves readers um anxious stressed and unhappy um, this is an image of of an old movie poster for um the buck rogers uh series so in the in the early days of motion pictures, theaters would show these, these serials, these ongoing stories. And each week, it, the, 
the episode, they'd be like maybe five, 10 minutes long. The episode would end in it with a cliffhanger, with something that the, 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 the hero is, is on the railroad tracks or the hero is about to you know, be pushed over a waterfall or something. And so the kids would all want to go back the next week to find out what happened. So it was kind of like this, this, this built-in um, entertainment system that, that, uh, or that, that had built-in ambiguity because they didn't want it to end because they wanted the kids to come back the next week and buy another ticket for the movies. Um, it's, it's something, but before I show this slide, as I said before, we actively seek this out. We'll listen to a piece of music and wait until the end because that piece of music has a very satisfying end that makes us feel good. We'll watch a television show or watch a, a movie that we've seen before, maybe that we've seen many times. And often we do that because we love the ending. The ending makes us feel good. Everything wraps up. It's very clear what happens. And it's, and it's, a, and it's just a very satisfying feeling. Um, and I have two slides that, um, that, that had pieces of music. And I'm not going to be able to use those because they, they don't work in this slideshow. But it's OK. I'm going to invite you if you want to uh, if you want to listen to these um, these two pieces of music. One is Stravinsky's Firebird Suite, and this is an image of Gustavo Dudamel, who's the conductor of the Los Angeles Philharmonic, conducting the Firebird Suite by Stravinsky. And then I have another. I had another piece of music, um, the Second Symphony by Charles Ives, and this is a photograph of Charles Ives, uh, the composer, um, which, which does not end in a satisfactory way. Uh, the Firebird Suite ends in a very satisfactory major chord, and, the, and Charles Ives' Second Symphony ends with a big horn blaring of a, of a, of a dissonant um, chord that leaves everybody sort of confused and, um, and unhappy. But let me go back to Whoops, I'm going the wrong way here. One second. So, so this is another example that I that I put in the slideshow just in case. Um, this is a this is an example of the Happy Birthday song that we sing here in the United States. It's very common. Um, I chose the name Liam in this song because that happens to be the most popular boy's name last year, according to our federal government, who keeps statistics of such things or lists of such things. And I, I had a paraeducator or a teaching assistant in my classroom uh, for a number of years named Eleanor, and she taught me this version of Happy Birthday. And she was deaf and um, and and she probably didn't have much experience hearing this, but the reason she loved it is she loved the way it left hearing people because it didn't have a satisfying end. And so what her uh, version of happy birthday is, is you just take off the first syllable in the song. So the first syllable is hap in happy birthday. You take that off and you start with the second syllable, which is P. Okay, so because I couldn't make the videos work, you're gonna you're gonna have to suffer through my singing. So so I'm gonna do my best to sing this um, as Eleanor taught it to me. Um, and here here is Eleanor's version of the Happy Birthday song. Okay, ready? Here we go. P birthday to you, hap. P birthday to you, hap. P birthday, dear Liam, happy birthday to you. Well, Eleanor thought that was just hysterical because she said hearing people can't stand that it ends on that note. Um, 
And we want we want it to to have a clear ending. And that's why I have this slide this slide here that talks about consonants and dissonance in music. So uh, this slide says one of the key things to note about consonant sounds is that they sound very stable. You don't feel any anxiety if the music doesn't change because there's no feeling of needing the sound to be resolved. Um, dissonance, on the other hand, is jarring, unnerving, unsettling. It creates tension. And in Western music, often that tension is settled at the end through a consonant chords or a series of consonant chords. And if any of you are fans of horror movies, um, this is a this is a, a, a typical way that horror, like good or bad horror movies are structured. So there's tension, release, tension, release, tension, 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 release. That's kind of a basic plot structure, I think, for a lot of, a lot of films. Um, so it's this idea that you can have con you can have dissonance, but you're craving, you're, you're anticipating that moment when it all comes together and it has a nice, a nice clear chord. This morning I was at my health club listening to, uh, through my, to music through my AirPods and I was listening to Simon and Garfunkel, uh, Bridge Over Troubled Water. And that's a great example of a song that just ends with a very satisfying major chord. Um, so, Closure. Clo the idea of closure has been around for a while, but it typically refers to something called cognitive closure. And cognitive closure generally, well, I think I have a slide for that. So let, let me hold off on that. There's three terms on this slide, cognitive closure, need for closure and need for cognitive closure. All of these, all of these um, terms are, are used sort of kind of interchangeably, but, but I don't think correctly. The one I want to use is need for closure. That's what I'm talking about here is that is the human need we have for a clear and satisfying end to something. Cognitive closure, is a concept that was developed by Dr. Ari Kroglansky, who's um, at the University of Maryland in the US. And cognitive closure refers to an individual's desire for a firm answer to a question and an aversion toward ambiguity. So the idea of cognitive closure is that people rush to a to to a to an answer even if even if it's even if they don't have all the facts or even if it's not, not a smart thing to do because we don't like ambiguity. We have an aversion towards it. So we want to come to an answer so that we can move on. Um, but for purposes of what I'm doing, I'm calling this need for closure. And again, um, here, the, here's the same slide again. Almost everyone wants and craves closure. That is true, but I will, I will admit to you that I do believe it's a spectrum. So that there are probably people who need it more and there are probably people that can take a little bit less. So it is a spectrum, but, um, but almost everybody wants and craves it. And now I'm gonna, I'm gonna show you a quote from a, a professor at the University of Bradford in the UK named Dr. Pam Ramsden. And I wanna read this quote and then I wanna go back and point out two things that she says from the social science research. Um, and that, that graphic across the top, the, whatever, the, the somewhere between strong need for closure and whatever, that's just, that, that was me, that wasn't from Dr. Ramsden. She writes, every person's need for closure is different and appears to vary as a function of the situation as well as personality characteristics and values. When we are under stress, for example, our need for closure increases. 
and certain types of personalities are different in the ways they approach closure. One study found that people who prefer order and predictability, having a, a rigid way of thinking and a low tolerance for ambiguity, struggle when they are unable to find the answers to help them move on. Here are, here are the two points that I want to draw from this quote that I think are so important. First, she writes, when we are under stress, our need for closure increases. So we have, we have social science research to, that, that, that demonstrates this. When we are under stress, our need for closure increases. So people who are under stress, and we know that, that children and young adults who are deaf blind operate much of their lives at high levels of stress, but simply as a result of being deaf blind, that when we're under stress, we need even more closure than is typically required. Okay, that's the first thing. And then she says, one study found that people who prefer order and predictability, and you know who I'm talking about here, so almost all the people I've ever met who are deaf blind are people who prefer order and predictability, just as a as a as a kind of a as a as a need just to to make life livable and to get through their day um, and not have constant chaos and disorder and unpredictability. So people who prefer order and predictability struggle when they are unable to find the answers to help them move on. And so I think um, uh, Dr. Ramston wasn't writing about deaf blindness, but she certainly could have been. Um, so, so I want to show you a scale uh, that was um, that was developed by Ari Kriglansky and his colleague Webster. It's the it's it it started as a as as what was called the Webster and Kriglansky scale, and it was adapted by two uh, social scientists at the University of Ghent in Belgium. And I'm, and I'm sorry, I, I don't know if I'm pronouncing their, their last names right. Uh, Roetz and Van Heil, Van Heil uh, scale that was developed in 2010. And these two uh, social science researchers took the Webster and Kruglansky scale and they, they modified it and condensed it down to 15 items. And, and, the way this, this scale is scored is on a, on a the, the answers are, on a, are on, a, uh, on a scale from one to six. One being, I don't agree with this. Six being, I very, very strongly agree with this statement. And what I'm going to invite you to do, if you'd like, is because you have this slideshow, is, is do the scale and just see where you fall on the, on the, the Roetz and Van Heil ambiguity need for closure scale. Uh, and here are the 15 items from this scale. I don't like situations that are uncertain. I dislike questions that could be answered in many different ways. I feel uncomfortable when I don't understand the reason why an event occurred in my life. When I have made a decision, I feel relieved. I dislike it when a person's statement could mean many different things. I do not usually consult many different opinions before forming my own views. I find that a well-ordered life with regular hours suits my temperament. That is certainly true for me. I don't like to go into a situation without knowing what I can expect from it. I don't like to be with people who are capable of unexpected actions. I enjoy having a clear and structured mode of life. 
I feel irritated when one person disagrees with what everyone else in the group believes. I would quickly become impatient and irritated if I could not find a solution to a problem immediately. And the last three, when I am confronted with a problem, I'm dying to reach a solution very quickly. I find that establishing a consistent routine enables me to enjoy life more. And then finally, the item to end all items, number 15, I dislike unpredictable situations. So that's that that's the scale. You're welcome to do it on your own. I, I don't I'm not suggesting we use this on children, although it is used on children, but I'm not suggesting you go out and you use this on your your students who are deaf blind. But think about it and try it on yourself. Um, I think if there's 90 points possible uh, if each if each of the 15 items can be scored up to a six. And I think I'm about an 84. So I'm about the of all the people I know that have taken the scale, I come out at about the highest. Um, so we have just uh, seven minutes left. Um, I want to. I want to. I want to close with or start closing down with just just mentioning that um, that we might have different perspectives on closure compared to the students we serve who are deaf blind if we are sighted and hearing. And this is a image on this slide of some rainbow colored cupcakes face down uh, that looks like outside on a on a stone patio perhaps in a in a backyard and so it looks like somebody dropped a tray of cupcakes and i like this i like this image for this reason imagine the following scenario you are a child who is deaf blind and you and your class has been invited into the class next door for a cupcake party and I don't know about you, but when I was a child, there was nothing better than getting out of work and getting to go to a cupcake party. That was always that was always great news. So the teacher would usually say something like, "Boys and girls, you know, if if we we have a very special invitation, so if everybody is on their best behavior this morning and does a good job, we can go to a cupcake party after lunch." Okay, so so. The child's class goes into the cupcake party. The child is handed a cupcake. And much to the child's dismay, they drop the cupcake and the cupcake lands face down on the floor in the classroom. Now, that child can do a number of things. The child can reach down and grab the cupcake off the floor and try to put it all back together in their hand and eat it as fast as they can before somebody takes it away. They can have a big meltdown and start sobbing uncontrollably because this one thing that they were so looking forward to is ruined. The divergent perspective here is that there might be a table in the corner of the room covered with cupcakes. So all of the sighted and hearing children in the room know that there are plenty more cupcakes. So if you drop yours on the floor, there is another one to be had. But the child who's deaf blind may, may not have that information. So from their perspective, this thing is over. This beautiful experience that I have been looking forward to all morning and enjoying this cupcake has ended in a, in a catastrophic way. And now I have to decide what I'm gonna do. You know, what, what is going to be my response? That's, a, that's one divergent perspective on closure. Uh, another divergent perspective of clo on closure is, a, is, is something that happened when I was teaching. Uh, this is one of my former students who I've maintained a friendship with over, 
almost 40 years. She's turning 60, I think, in, in two years. Uh, it's one of the benefits of being a teacher for a long time is I have <laughs> students who are, who are um, getting up there in age themselves. But uh, this student, when I was teaching her, she was nearing graduation. And at the time that she was going to graduate from our program and leave school, she had experienced two really big losses in her life. She had, uh, her grandfather had died fairly unexpectedly, I, I, I think. And also her, her dog that she just loved had died. And, and she started having um, a lot of stress and anxiety about graduation. Um, a lot of stress and anxiety about graduation. And, and, and talking with the psychologists at the school, we wondered if she might think that when people graduate from school, it's the same as dying because all of her fellow students who had graduated in years before her just disappeared. She never saw them again. And we wondered if she might not be equating graduation with death. And so before she graduated, we, uh, we put on a, a reunion of former students. And you should have seen her face when former students came back onto campus and she could see that they were still alive and well and in most cases thriving. And it's the face she still has every time she sees me. And I just saw her about three months ago, we had dinner together. And every time she sees me after all these years, she has an expression. And by the way, I've have, I have a, 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 a approval to share this story. Um, but she's, she's always so grateful to, uh, to see people from her past as, as we all are. I mean, I am too. I understand that. So, so just because we have a certain perspective on closure as hearing sighted adults doesn't mean that that's how the that's how the, um, the, child, the children that we serve are experiencing it. So I'm going to skip a slide, and I'm just going to show this slide, which was also a video, but it's not going to play. But, but I can make the point without playing the video. And here's my point, is that I imagine that many children who are deafblind experience school, their school careers, as this nonstop, ever flowing river. A river that doesn't provide opportunities to get off, to dock, and go into a restaurant or you know, whatever. It's just this flowing river that flows night and day. It just keeps moving and the, and the current just keeps moving things down the river. I think for students in general ed programs, and, and this would be true of deafblind students who are, who are in general ed programs and so experience the kinds of big opportunities for closure that I talked about before, they, they have opportunities for closure all the time turning in assignments, finishing a group project, um, doing, doing a project in a club or, or playing a, spo a sport or as that image was being in a, in a musical or a play, graduating, moving from, from class to class each year, so changing classrooms, getting a new teacher. We do this terrible thing in the United States where we where students graduate from high school at age 18, but if you have, if you're in special education, you get to spend four more years at school. So all of your all of your friends that you've grown up with graduate and move on, and you stay at the school for another four years. Um, 
uh, and 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 often in the United States, the programs are at the same site as the as the student went to high school at. So so they really do just come back the next fall to the same often the same classroom or maybe it's a classroom down the hall. But um, but this it just keeps going. They miss all these opportunities to um, to experience closure, to have that satisfaction, and and to as much as possible, get above the, the chaos and ambiguity that they perceive in the world in order to, um, in order to, uh, to maintain um, healthy levels of stress and anxiety. So um, that is it. I consider you all ambassadors now of this, uh, of this concept and, um, and I thank you and we want to save some time at the end now for questions and answers. So I am going to stop sharing my screen and turn this over to Meredith and Melanie, and they are going to see if you all have any questions or comments. I would very much like to hear what you think.